Well, this is the grand finale. I hope you guys are really excited. He's going to razzle-dazzle, wow, and amaze you guys. Just because you have a full seat doesn't mean you're going to need it. You're just going to be on the edge the whole time. So I hope you guys are ready. If I get a nice big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Jared Bird. All right, well, that was a bunch of lies, but um, if you're here for that case study, um, obviously you'll see this isn't that case study of a large bank deployment. Uh, things got changed up, so if you want to leave now, don't worry, I won't be offended. Um, what we're going to be talking about is providing value throughout the organization using Nagios. Uh, typically, most organizations, at least that I've seen, that have Nagios deployed, they're using it for the traditional infrastructure monitoring, uh, servers, switches, services, uptime, that sort of thing. And basically what we're going to be talking about is how Nagios can provide value to other areas of the organization. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. So who is Jared Bird? Um, obviously that's not my real photo. I think the only thing we have in common is the belly. Um, I've been in IT for about 15 years now. I started out doing break fix stuff, kind of moved into server admin. Uh, from there, I got into network admin. <clears throat> and then from there, I just kind of transi transitioned into security. And I've been doing that for like seven, eight years now. Uh, I currently work as a security engineer for a large healthcare organization. Um, so <clears throat> we talk about Nagios. So we know we can monitor basically anything you wanted to. This is just some of the things that you know various people are using Nagios to monitor. And when we're monitoring these things, we can also think about how we can use what we're monitoring to provide value to other areas. So when we're talking about providing value, what exactly is that, right? Like how are we gonna provide value to these other areas? Uh, some of the ways are by providing knowledge to the different areas. And by providing knowledge, we can assist other departments. And by assisting other departments, we'll actually strengthen there's one, see, I won't be offended. Um, by assisting the other departments, we can actually strengthen interdepartment relationships. You see these kind of relate to each other. Um, and by having good interdepartment relationships, you can actually achieve company-wide goals a lot easier. And one of the big things now most enterprises and small companies are really hitting on is reducing cost, uh, especially in this economy. So. The ability to provide value, you know, you can kind of see some of the benefits by working with the other departments, but the first thing you need to do is understand what are the goals of the other departments. I mean, do they really care about the uptime of the switches? Well, I guess most departments probably would, but they don't really care if it is up, they just care when it goes down. Um, so you really need to sit down with other departments and figure out what their goals are and what they're trying to accomplish. And if you approach a new different department and actually like set up a meeting and say the meeting's just to discuss what their goals are, they're actually very responsive. Um, some of them a little confused, you know, they're trying to figure out what you're actually trying to do because they don't believe you just want to understand their goals. But then when you explain that you want to help use your systems to help them, they're, they're actually pretty responsive. Um, so we'll cover some of these. Infrastructure. Like I said, network, server, desktop teams. I'm not going to really go into detail here because I think everybody's pretty familiar with uh, monitoring that sort of thing. Um, so their, their concerns are typically availability, capacity, utilization, making sure servers, services, everything's functioning properly. Um, one of the departments that can benefit greatly from a deployment of Nagios is the security department. Typically, uh, security is concerned with, you know, preventing data theft, uh, deterring identity theft, avoiding legal issues, and some of those legal issues kind of tie into protecting the brand. A uh, common thing that you hear in the InfoSec community, InfoSec is uh, information security, for those that don't know that term, <coughs> um, is the CIA triad stands for uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And enterprises really focus on that. Um, it's pretty common throughout. It's a theme. So the security department 
they're really concerned about threats and mitigating those threats. Um, some threats, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, uh, default configurations, and those would be, you know, you, you get a switch, you just drop it in, and it's working, right? But it's got a default configuration. So if there's an attacker on your network, it's going to be pretty easy for them to get in. And, I mean, if they own your switch, they can pretty much do whatever they want. Um, so default configurations is a threat. Website defacement, I mean, that's kind of obvious, right? You know, a corporation doesn't want their website to be defaced. It doesn't look good if a potential customer, potential clients checking out the company, they go to the website and it says we're the worstly rated company around or something like that. I mean, it doesn't do good for business. Uh, so that's another threat. Um, missing patches is really a threat that you would think would be easy to fix, right? You apply the patches. But when you've got, you know, 60, 70,000 machines, it actually becomes a little tougher than you would think. Um, like I said, I, I work at a large healthcare provider, and we actually have a team that that's all they do is work on patching. And it's, I mean, maybe they're just not good at what they do, but it's, there's a lot of missing patches still. And I, I, just, I mean, from what I've seen, I used to do some penetration testing, and we'd go out to clients that think they've got the best patching process around, and they'd still have machines with like MS08067 missing on it. That's a, uh, a Microsoft patch that there's exploits readily available for. And I mean, that's a patch that was from 2008. So it's four years old, and it's still missing on machines. But that's a, a real big vulnerability that companies are dealing with. Um, so it'd be another threat. Uh, DNS redirection, that's another threat that, you know, it, it seems small. But you can do a lot of things when you compromise somebody's DNS server. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with like that DNS changer thing from earlier this year, I guess late last year. But the, the DNS server, I mean, everybody's familiar with DNS, right? Yeah? It's like when you go to somewhere, it's actually pointing you to an IP. Yeah? All right. Um, so that's, that's another one, is the DNS redirection or DNS hijacking. And unauthorized use is another threat you know, permissions, that sort of thing, and making sure the right people are on the right systems. And there, like I said, there's many, many more. Um, this, I really didn't have a good spot to throw this quote in, so I just put it right here. But I thought this was a good quote. It was from the uh, director of the FBI. He gave it, or he gave his keynote at the RSA conference uh, earlier this year, the RSA conference 2012. He said there are only two types of companies those that have been hacked and those that will be. I, just, I thought it was a good quote. I had nowhere else to put it in my presentation, so I put it here. Um, so, like I was saying, default configurations. <clears throat> um, some of the issues there, default passwords. You know, if you put a, a Cisco firewall in, for example, and you leave the default passwords on there and your web interface is exposed to the public internet, I mean, is it really doing you any good? Probably not. Um, so default passwords need to be changed. Uh, blank SA account, you would think this would be a lot less common now that uh, I think it was SQL 2008 maybe started requiring a password for the SA account. But there's actually still a lot of companies with blank SA accounts. Uh, SA accounts, the system account for a SQL database, specifically MySQL. Um, and one of the ways that Nagios can help with that is by monitoring the SA account with a new set of credentials. So basically, in the way that I did this um, at a bank was, we set it up with the new credentials, because they had a problem where whenever they had an issue, they'd get the vendor involved. And the first thing a vendor usually does when they come in and troubleshoot something is set all the credentials back to what they were when they first installed the product. And you know sometimes it'd be a blank SA account or default credentials. But so if you set Nagios up to monitor with those new credentials and they change those back, well, what's going to happen? You're obviously going to get an alert when it went back to default. Uh, another thing you can do is use uh, XI, to, the auto discovery check for in-scare protocols, like Telnet. You know, if you've got all your routers, switches, firewalls, whatever, um, are using any in-scare protocols, you can Telnet, HTTP, 
Uh, you guys know why those are insecure? Maybe I should go into that a little bit. So <clears throat> when you're going to connect to a router using Telnet, right? Well, Telnet, everything's sent in the clear text, which means if I'm sniffing that traffic, I'm seeing everything as it's being sent. So you're logging into the router, well, you've got to send a password, right? And if that's in the clear and I'm seeing everything you're typing in, I'm going to see that password. So that's why, you know, like HTTP, that's an insecure protocol because everything's sent in the clear. Um, and so you can disable those, but then you're going to want to know if somebody decided, hey, I like using Telnet, I'm going to re-enable it. Well, you want to make sure that doesn't happen. And by using auto discovery, just kind of check. You can alert on that. And then you can also uh, do scheduled scans and outputs in Agios, uh, NMAP. Um, I've actually seen, it was, it was pretty good. Anybody familiar with Nessus? couple people. Nessus is a vulnerability scanner and I've actually seen somebody that they are running checks against the output from Nessus. You know where if they determine there's a new vulnerability detected it'll actually send an alert on that. So that's kind of cool. I mean you basically scheduled scans, outputs and audio. It's kind of straightforward, right? So we're talking about uh, website threats. Um, a couple ways you can monitor for defacement. I guess one way you can monitor for defacement. Um, is you can check for a, a string that you put on your website and it doesn't have to be you know displayed on your web page you can have it in a comment somewhere because um, typically when websites are defaced they'll, they'll change quite a bit of the content and so if you're checking your website for specific content and it doesn't exist and you didn't make the change and you're the one responsible for making changes you know something happened uh, another thing you can do is check for certificate expiration and I mean it's pretty easy to do and basically what that does um, certificates for the SSL connection on HTTP sites HTTPS um, they've got expirations that's just one thing you want to check uh, another thing you can do to and this is still helping the security department is uh, checking for uh, software if you've got an inventory of software you're using or you know all your desktops are using flash for example um, frequently Adobe decides to update their flash version due to vulnerabilities found or an exploit that's in the wild and most companies it's actually I mean Microsoft Adobe and there's a couple others that have fairly good notification systems now but a lot of software companies are still trying to get into you know some sort of process for notifying when a new version is available because of a security patch. Um, so an easy way to do that is just check the URL for the current version. And so what this is basically going to do is it, you're going to go out to Adobe's Flash site and check for that string. And that string is the actual version, the current version. So when Adobe updates it, their website will say instead of it being 11.4.102.265, it'll be 11.4.102.267 or whatever it may be. And then you get an alert and you know, okay, well, I should go check and see what this is all about. And then you can determine, you know, okay, was this a, a patch for a security related issue or was it just, you know, to turn the text from red to blue in the latest product, you know. So that's another one. Uh, like I was mentioning, DNS. Um, you can check your DNS servers, make sure your entries haven't changed. Um, you know, for example, if, uh, let's say, we'll, we'll use Bank of America, for example. You know, if Bank of America is supposed to resolve to this IP and all of a sudden it changes, you know, you, you should look at that and you know, all of a sudden the IP changes to somewhere over in Russia, for example. I, I mean, it's, I guess it's possible Bank of America hosts their servers in Russia, but probably doubt it. Um, so DNS hijacked and obviously that's got a high impact because people can redirect traffic. Um, like I mentioned that DNS changer one. Um, people are really targeting DNS servers because they can use it for like the click fraud. Has anybody heard of that? You know, basically so if, if I hijack your DNS server I can change it to, so say, google.com actually comes to my IP. And then when you actually come to my IP, I'm presenting you with ads that I get paid 
to display, you know, or you can even do clicks, whatever it is. But so it's kind of, there's some money behind it. And that's not a very good explanation, is it? Whatever, we'll keep going. Um, unauthorized use. Uh, LDAP checks, that works great for smaller companies, but I do not recommend you try and do that in an enterprise. You will get a lot of alerts. Um, I actually tried that. I, I recently started, I think, May at this company where they make, on average, I think it's close to probably a thousand changes to LDAP daily. Um, so a smaller company where there's 250, 300 employees, an LDAP, LDAP check is great because you can see, hey, this account was created. And if there's two people creating accounts, you just check with them. Say, hey, look, we've got this new administrator account was created. You know, is this valid? And if it wasn't, then, you know, look into things a little further. But um, I'm still trying to figure out a way to do it in an enterprise. But, yeah, it's just with the amount of account activity, it's pretty hard to do. Um, syslog output from your infrastructure. Uh, it could be switches, firewalls, what have you. And the main reason you want to output it to Nagios is if somebody compromises a system and they get root access, I mean, you basically have the ability to modify those logs as well. And if you're outputting all of that syslog information to Nagios, well, you hope that they haven't got root on your Nagios server as well. So you, you'll be able to kind of correlate the activity. And same with SNMP alerts, similar concept. Does that make sense? Sort of? Everybody sleeping? Everybody got so full from lunch, huh? All going to look like this. <laughs> All right. Um, audit and compliance. That's another area that Nagios can help with. Um, and compliance, obviously, their, their goal is to be compliant with different regulations, different standards, whatever it may be, depending on the industry that you're in. Um, you know, banking, commonly like GLBA. Uh, so we got, I'm gonna touch on PCI, SOX, and uh, HIPAA. Um, PCI is kind of the, the big one lately. And uh, as you see my disclaimer down here, the speaker will not be held responsible if Nagios does not help achieve compliance with a specific regulation. So you can't come back to me and say, hey, look, you told me this is going to work. So PCI, uh, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard is what PCI DSS stands for. And it covers any organization that processes, stores, or transmits credit card data. Um, basically, any merchant that's going to take a credit card uh, typically will have to comply in some sort of fashion. Uh, de it usually depends on the amount of transactions they process um, and the, the acquiring bank will usually work with the merchant and help them figure out where they're at um, like a level one merchant for example is if you process I think it's six million or more transactions a year and then they require an on-site assessment by a QSA which is qualified security That's a, I should know that because I, I was one for a while um, qualified security assessor and that's basically a company, uh, ASV, a proof scanning vendor. So a QSA is a qualified security assessor, and they have to work for a proof scanning vendor. And the QSA, I mean, you have to go take this test, sit through training, and then take the test. But basically, a level one merchant has to have one of them come in and go through all the standards and verify that they're compliant with everything, all the requirements. Um, there's 12 overall requirements, kind of sections, if you will, and there's uh, 287 individual requirements. How many people are actually familiar with PCI? Show of hands. All right, so a decent number. All right. Um, so I'll cover this in a little more detail. So uh, requirements one and two of the data security standard have to do with building and maintaining a secure network. And... Nagios can help with that in several different ways. Um, the easiest is to have auto discovery look for services that your policies and procedures have deemed not necessary, insecure, what have you. And so if, if you say, hey, look, this server is for this purpose, 
and you scan it and all of a sudden it's you know spitting out on a database port and you can go to that department of your server and say hey look what's this all about and basically you can provide some of these reports to your compliance department and say hey look you know we're scanning these systems at this interval and it's got these services running on it and compliance really loves to see fancy reports just a note um, the other thing is to check to verify that uh, vendor defaults have changed. Um, I believe that's section or requirement two that hits on that the most. And again, it's basically making sure that you know you don't have systems in there with the default credentials. Requirements three and four, protecting the cardholder data. Again, scanning for the insecure protocols. I'd have to look. There's a document with the actual individual requirements on, and how Nagio so help with those. If anybody wants that, let me know. And then uh, check for the expiration of SSL certificates. Uh, there's a couple requirements that specifically talk about um, SSL certificates and the expiration and how you destroy keys, that, that whole good thing. Requirements five and six, maintaining a vulnerability management program. Um, those have a lot to do with antivirus and it's so you, one of the things you have to do is prove that antivirus is running on your machines right and audit loves audit and compliance you know they don't like just being called audit audit and compliance they love to see reports that show here's our PCI systems here's how often we check to make sure the antivirus process is running so all you gotta do is check on those machines the antivirus process, it's running. I mean, pretty easy, but they love it. Uh, seven, eight, and nine, implement strong access control measures. Again, you can use the uh, LDAP check there. And this one's just basically checking to see if the LDAP server is functioning periodically. I think, you know, every, I think we do it five minutes, something like that. Um, in the web transaction monitoring, so another requirement, I think it's uh, specifically into using two-factor for remote access for any remote mobile devices. And you can use your, uh, the web transaction monitoring wizard to actually verify that your two-factor is working. Um, and no, we don't actually have it set up where it uses the two-factor key. I mean, if anybody could set that up, that'd be really cool. I want to hear about that, like how to get an RSA key into the monitoring wizard but basically what it does is it looks and sees that it's denied because the two-factor picked up on it so does that make sense I'm not very good at explaining that either am I so basically you take the web transaction monitoring wizard and you set it up to go through with the username and password right but then you're also supposed to enter in that second factor which is typically like an RSA key or a fob something like that where you enter in the number on the fob which changes every minute. That's why it's really hard to get it into Nagios. But so we actually look and make sure we get that message from the two factor saying, sorry, you didn't enter in the right key. And we hope that means it's functioning properly. I guess there's instances where it may not be, but so requirements 10 and 11 regularly monitor and test networks. Um, some of those requirements have to do with uh, time specifically NTP, and you can just check your NTP servers, make sure that's all functioning properly. And another big part of that is the offloading of logs. I, I touched on that briefly a little bit earlier. Um, but shipping your logs off to Nagios, or having Nagios pick them up, however you want to do it, uh, will help out with quite a few requirements there. And then uh, requirement 12, maintaining information security program. You know, honestly, it was, it was like, how can Nagios help with this? I mean, it's all policy-based, right? But one of the ways it can help is you've got Nagios monitoring all these PCI systems, right? Well, use Nagios to be the base for your list of the incident response plan. You know, basically, you take all your systems you have in Nagios and say, okay, you know, well, who's responsible for these? Well, let's look at who the contacts are for the alerts on each system. You know, it actually, it, it's a good start for somebody that hasn't thought about an incident response plan, and now they've got this PCI requirement saying, oh, we need an incident response plan. Where do we start? 
that's a pretty good start right there. You look at, here's our systems that are, you know, deemed to be in the PCI. And then you look at the contacts for each one, and you start talking to them about what's your response if the system goes down or gets breached. So that's kind of PCI. SOX. Sarbanes-Oxley, or Public Company Accounting Reform and Investors Protection Act. Now you see why they just call it SOX, right? Um, that basically, it's, it was enacted to ensure that uh, financial reports are accurate. You know, after the whole Enron, WorldCom, I think there's a few other companies. They, they decided that, you know, we should probably have some sort of regulation that, you know, these financial reports are accurate. Um, most of it, I don't know, maybe you care about, I really don't, other than Section 404. I mean, a lot of it really has nothing to do with any sort of IT stuff other than the assessments of internal control. And basically what that's saying is, well, I think I wrote this one out, yep. That NAGIS can help management show that controls for assuring the integrity of the financial reports are effective. That's kind of saying a lot without saying much, isn't it? Um, so basically, what management has to be able to show is, I generated my financial reports using data from these systems. But they also have to show that controls on those systems are adequate to make sure that the information is correct and accurate. And so I, I kind of mentioned, I mean, this kind of falls in line with PCI too. I mean, if you show that, you know, the access is proper on those systems, um, you've got the logs for those systems shipping off. Um, a couple more, but everybody kind of gets that, right? All right, good deal. So HIPAA. You know, I, I like to say that healthcare is where banking was about eight years ago. You know, companies were really getting breached left and right. The government kind of realized, hey, we need to stop the bleeding on this. So they started enacting some regulation, putting a little more, uh, I don't know, proper word for that. Um, more or less enforcing some of the legislation that they put out. And in the past two or three years, um, all of these are from the past two or three years. Some of them are actually from like a couple weeks ago, like this one down here. Uh, the $1.5 million HIPAA violation. So HIPAA has really become more, um, I guess, front and center for healthcare. Because like I was saying, so, I don't know if I finished that actually. When I was saying that healthcare is kind of where banking was eight years ago. Because they were getting compromised left and right. And the government said, we need to stop the bleeding. So they put this legislation in place. That's kind of where healthcare is now because a lot of the attackers and you know, I guess bad hackers, if you will, have realized that medical records contain a lot of valuable information. I mean, there's social security number, typically, birth date, address, I mean, all sorts of fun stuff. And they realize that those are you know, just as valuable, if not more valuable, than a bank account number. Because a bank account number, you, you change the information, really not a value anymore, right? I mean, has anybody tried changing their social security number? It's a lot harder to do. You know, you can't just walk in and say, hey, I'd like to change my number. They give you a new account and you leave, like you can at a bank. So HIPAA's, like I said, become front and center. Um, at least what I've seen, I don't know, maybe other people have seen different, but I think it's becoming more of a hot topic lately. And HIPAA basically says you need to protect that information. Um, the specific portion that I'm concerned with is the technical safeguards. There's uh, four subpoints, if you will. The uh, access control. I mean, that's, that's essentially saying we only want to allow the authorized people to access our EPHI. You know, the, the server team, for instance, probably doesn't need to be accessing the medical records. So you just need to have adequate controls in place to make sure that doesn't happen, and you're monitoring that. Um, and again, audit control. You know, record and examine the access 
to the systems containing EPHI. And again, with like the off shipping of logs, you can kind of correlate some of that. And then uh, integrity controls. That one, I mean, is essentially, I think I summed that one up by saying EPHI is not improperly altered or destroyed. And again, you can monitor, you know, to see who's accessing what, um, who's changing what. And then the transmission security is basically just to guard against unauthorized access to that information. And again, like some of the ways that we can do that is with a certificate expiration, for example, um, and checking that certificate to make sure it's our certificate, you know, where if somebody was man in the middle of that traffic, it might not be that same certificate. Does that make sense? Sort of? Anybody still awake? No? All right. Um, all right. How about questions? Anybody have any questions? A little short, but I don't think anybody's going to complain, right? Last presentation of the day ends a little short. It's all right, right? No? Throwing tomatoes? Any additional questions? Is anybody awake? Oh, there's a hand. <laughs> I'm awake, Jared. <laughs> um, so do you know, I mean, do you have, you, you're worked, you've you worked in information security and data security with a bunch of different companies, and you know different people, uh, you know, like in the security arena in the Twin Cities here. How many people do you know are actively using Nagios to help um, comply with regulations like this? Do you know? I mean, There's actually a, a fair number. Um, some of them weren't doing it a while ago, but then, you know, just in talking with them, you know, it's like, well, hey, here's what I'm trying to do. You know, I wish there was something that could do this. And it's like, well, you could probably do that with Nagios. You know, and I just kind of figured out a way to use it. Like I was saying with the compliance stuff, you know, checking LDAP, for example, you know, because the, like, for instance, a, a smaller bank, you know, they, they'd have four or five admins and, you know, the worry was, what if one of these admins goes rogue and creates a bunch of backdoor accounts, right? And so they terminated. We terminate that one account that we know he was using, but now what about these four other accounts that he created? How are we going to know about those? Well, if you're monitoring LDAP for account creation, any account that's created is going to show up. And then you cross-reference that with HR. So if you never got the hire sheet on this person and this account was created, then you look at who created that account and talk to them and say, hey, look, what's this account created? And, you know, well, sorry, that was my backdoor account in case I get fired, you know. So... Which is one reason you should lock down your Nagia servers so they don't create an account there and alter what's being monitored, <laughs> correct? Yep. Any other additional questions? All right, how about a nice big round of applause one more time, ladies and gentlemen.